Look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. This week, I'll be leading the ladies-only midweek retreat in the beautiful Poconos in Pennsylvania at Twin Pines Camp and Conference Center. It's my eighth year in a row, and with one year off for that COVID year, and one exceptional year prior to that when a horrific downpour of rain caused flood damage and downed electrical lines. Let's just say this. You guessed it. We managed through the entire retreat with no baths, No brushing of teeth except for using bottled water and no electric because the water pump was on electric. But fortunately, we could still eat and due to the generator that was in the main lodge, it could have been a disaster. But what an amazing time we had. Bathing ourselves with, yes, bottled water and baby wipes. (laughs) Nobody complained. There was no sound system no PowerPoint, nothing. Just 30 precious ladies singing a cappella with flashlights searching their Bibles. You know, we surely learned a lot that year about the provision of God and the patience needed to work through major, major inconveniences. Well, one of the things that we're going to talk about this week at Ladies Only Retreat here at Twin Pines, we're going to talk about the Bible. It's long debated as the best sellingest book of all time. It might also be one of the most quoted of all time, too, as well. But how much of what is cited as coming from the Old or New Testaments is actually in the Bible? A couple of funny things here. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but spare the rod, spoil the child is not in Scripture. This could very well be just a paraphrase, I guess, of Proverbs 13.24, but the statement doesn't really exist in any translation of the Bible. The Bible verse actually reads, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. And Samuel Butler, a 17th century British poet, actually coined the phrase, spare the rod and spoil the child, in a very satirical poem called (laughs) Hudibras. <laughs> Another one, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, I guess we weren't very godly a few years ago when the electric went out and we had no water here. But no, Jesus did not say this in the Sermon on the Mount, nor in any of his teachings recorded in the Gospels. This Bible misquote might have its root in James 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Maybe that's where it comes from. Oh, another one, and this might get me in trouble, but the actual phrase, blessed and highly favored, is not in Scripture. Now, Paul does say, with many writings in the New Testament letters, he says, you know, They never wrote to the churches in Corinth in Rome declaring Christians to be blessed and highly favored. And as good as the phrase does sound, it's not really like that in the Bible. And I'm sure I'll get letters on this one. But you know what? Yes, we are blessed. And yes, we have the favor of God. But the actual phrase, blessed and highly favored, is not literally in Scripture like that. And some quote it as if it is. And then there's another one. All things work together for good. Yes, but not by itself. There's another passage in which context is key. What things work together for whose good? Romans 8.28 reads in full, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose full context. Oh, here's another one. My grandmother used to say this all the time. God moves in mysterious ways. (laughs) 
Well, this might be a universal confession among all Christians, but this phrase is stated nowhere like that in Scripture. Perhaps the phrase can be linked maybe to Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Maybe that's where it comes from. Another one. Pride comes before the fall. While this phrase, often attributed to the Bible, is almost correct. The actual verse found in Proverbs 16.18 actually reads, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But all that to say, this year's retreat theme for this week is going to be a study in the book of Psalms. And each session We're going to highlight certain passages, dissecting each line and phrase, and hopefully take a good look and lesson on what it means to pray the Psalms. And as a project, each woman will be able to rewrite a Psalm or two in their own words, with their own sentiments, and in their own language. And I pray that this will be a significant and spiritual way to unfold some of the not-so-popular Psalms and discover how they can apply to each one of us. Who wrote the Psalms, the greatest collection of songs, prayers, and poetry ever put together? Well, although King David didn't write all of the Psalms, he is its most prolific author, with over 80 of them credited to him. Other writers include Moses, Heman the Ezraite, and Ethan the Ezraite, and Solomon and Asaph, and the sons of Korah. Several of them don't come with any credit. And collectively, all 150 chapters of the book of Psalms constitute the largest book in the entire Bible. The New Testament quotes it more than 75 times. And the epistle to the Romans written by Paul quotes or references it more than 14 times. So the book of Psalms not only contains the shortest and longest chapters of Scripture, but also the very center of the Bible. Many of the Psalms are prophetic in nature, and Jesus told his disciples after the resurrection that what happened to him was prophesied to occur in part in the writings of this popular book, and you can read that in Luke 24, 44. So the purpose of many of the Psalms is public worship in Israel's temple, although some are more suited for private devotion. They all, however, ultimately lead people to worship the eternal. They passionately record a person's response to give God the situation and the circumstances at the time. And it's a response to God. Some of the Psalms cry out to God during a trial and others seek his intervention in their and others' affairs. Some focus on his blessings or curses while others sing his praises. And the more I read it, the more I love it. The prophetic theme exists within what they call a five-folder or original structure of the Psalms. And that's usually the first section, which is the first chapter to chapter 41. And it refers to the Passover, the beginning of Israel as a nation, the start of the New Testament. Then there's section two, chapters 42 to 72, which shows Israel as a single body in the land of Israel and pictures the creation of the New Testament church. Then there's section three, starting with chapter 73, all the way through to 89, which describes the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So in many ways, this section parallels the prophecies of the coming great tribulation. And then there's section four, which is 90 through 106, which revolves around the millennial reign of Christ and shows Israel regathered after their ruin. And then section 5, which is 107 to 150, it pictures a time when Judah, all of Israel, shall again be delivered as they were in the time of Esther. So there are numerous ways to divide the book of Psalms other than just by section. For example, there are royal songs of spiritual role of kings in the worship to God, You know, they emphasize his role as creator and savior. And then there's repentance songs. (laughs) Can I tell you? (laughs) I'm grateful that there are repentance songs. And they are those that the composer confesses the sins 
of their self to the Lord and asks for forgiveness. And then Psalm 51 is a very good example of this type of song. Songs of wisdom and teaching focus on the contrast between both the righteous and the wicked and God's blessings and curses. And then Psalm 1 is in this category. Those who wrote the book of Psalms created songs that run crazily with human emotion from cries for help while suffering in a severe trial to exalting God's name and praising him for his wonderful works. It's part of the Bible worthy to be read and studied and sung again and again. But I don't know why it took me so long to figure this out, but the Psalms also offer prophecies centered on Jesus. I mean, just taking the time to prepare for this retreat. I've spent some time studying how the Psalms predicted the birth of Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 7. Jesus is also mentioned in chapter 45, 6 through 7, as the deity. In chapter 69, verse 9, the ministry, the priesthood. In chapter 110, the care for the needy. In chapter 72, and the use of parables to convey his teachings in Psalm 35 and also Psalm 118. It also talks about his betrayal in chapter 41 his crucifixion, and the words that he would speak in chapter 22, and the resurrection in chapters 2 and 16. Listen, I was having a Holy Ghost moment. The ascension into heaven was even in chapter 68, and everlasting reign in chapter 102, verses 26. The entire plan of salvation centering around Jesus in the book of Psalms. I love this. So the 23rd Psalm is beautifully written and arguably the most recited passage of Scripture. And I found that most people focus primarily on verses 1 and 2. But verse 3 is also filled with a wealth of powerful truths. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So what does that mean? He restores my soul. You know, I always thought it meant that God strengthens me when I'm weak, and that's exactly how some people translate that phrase. But the meaning goes a little deeper than just a physical strengthening. It literally means that God will bring our soul back from its wanderings or wrongdoings, and nothing is more ready to wander astray than sheep, and nothing has more trouble finding its way back than sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we're always vulnerable to failure and backsliding. We are prone to leaving the right way, the way of truth, and the way of duty, and, you know, kind of detour onto the familiar, the brightly lit paths of unrighteousness. (laughs) That's exactly what Jesus means when he says, wide is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And that's in Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. It's easy to get off course. It's easy to get lost. It's easy to get on the busy highway that leads to destruction and just follow the traffic. It's easy to let the devil take the wheel. And in those moments, remember that God is merciful. He is a God of restoration. Cry out to Jesus, and he will find you even when you have abandoned him. And when God restores souls, guess what? He shows us our errors, and he brings us to repentance, and he calls us back to our duty, and he forgives, and he forgets. And if he did not do so, we would wander endlessly, and we would be undone. The Bible indicates that God can heal our backsliding Jeremiah 3.22, that word healing is interesting because it signifies that God views falling away like a disease that needs immediate care. We can take our weakness, our doubt, our unbelief, our failure, and our sin to the Lord. And just as surely as God can open blind eyes, he can heal 
a hardened heart. Praise God. And just as surely as God can heal the lame, he can mend a wounded soul. He can and will heal our backsliding or turning away if we turn back to him. He leads. And once God restores us, he will be our leader. In fact, he will demand to be our leader. Sometimes we try to lead God. We try to manipulate God's will to fill and fit our own desires. But all of those efforts end in pain. God is all-powerful. We can't share in his lordship. He could end a lot of difficult lessons right now by simply allowing God to lead us in all things. That means God leads our finances, our time, our entertainment, our appearance, our conversations, our futures, our relationships, our families, everything. He leads us in paths of righteousness. But what are those paths of righteousness? Well, I would like to say they're paths that indicate well-walked trails that others have blazed. And I can think of many, many trailblazers right now off the top of my head that made and paved a way for me. It's a trail that goes off the paved roads, well-worn by travelers who created natural paths through difficult terrains. And in the prophet Jeremiah's days, Israel rejected the Lord's ways and began following whatever roads looked good to them. Think about it. Look at the command that God gave to the people in Jeremiah 6.16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the highways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. They willingly disobeyed the word of the Lord and invited judgment into their lives. So I got to say something to you. Let's not keep making the same mistake over and over again. Remember, in the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. And you can read that in Proverbs 12, 28. For his name's sake. He restores and he leads us into righteousness because it brings honor to his name. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't do so out of love for us because he certainly does. But just like a parent experiences dishonor when a child refuses to be obedient, God is dishonored by our own tantrums. And when we enter back into covenant with God, it restores honor to us and to him. So you've just experienced just a little about what will happen this year at Twin Pines 2023. And my guess is there will be a whole lot more learning and a whole lot more revelation going on too. It happens beyond me every single year, especially when women begin to worship together and pray together and search the scriptures together. Thank you for listening and May the blessing of God's Son, Jesus, be upon you as you have blessed us. Stay close by getting on SueDuffield.com. And again, we thank you for keeping this ministry alive and well. So let me tell you, maybe a little bit of a mini retreat you could have on your own this week. I encourage you to continue to sing the Psalms in worship every day of your life. Pray the Psalms. Walk the Psalms and live the Psalms, and may that anxious heart find comfort and rest because of the truth found in Scripture. We love you, and we'll see you next time.